Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Gwinnett. If you all want to find your way in from the foyer uh, and join us this kind of chilly morning. I don't know. As a Floridian, I was not fully prepared this morning, not going to lie. Uh, anyway, please come in. We're happy to have you this morning. Go ahead and stand, and we will get ready to worship the Lord. Please take a moment, reach around you, say welcome to Calvary Chapel if you don't mind. Well, let me welcome you to Calvary Chapel. Thank you for coming out in this uh, very brisk and cold morning. You may be seated, please. Thank you. Very, may be seated. Thank you very much. Let me encourage you to look in your bulletins, if you don't mind, a couple of announcements. 
Uh, let me just mention this. Uh, the golf cart people asked me to let you know that next Sunday morning, I think it's going to be in the teens. So the golf carts will not be running. The poor people that take these golf carts out, we'd like them in one piece and sort of thaw it out by the time the service starts. So what we're going to do is encourage you to come up and drop people off at the door here or close to the door. What we're going to do is pro probably block off the actual underneath because we don't want, want children running around and running through. It can be dangerous. But we'll encourage you to stop right outside the overhang and drop everybody off that you can. And then uh, maybe brave the weather and walk up from there if you don't mind doing that. But we'd appreciate you doing that. Just to let you know that we want to have a little mercy. Th these people that do the golf cart, sometimes it's pretty bad weather with rain and cold, and, and uh, so just let you know that. I want to mention, too, this coming Thursday, uh, there's a Mom's Night Out. It's going to be from 6.30 to 8. Uh, it uh, starts, it's going to be starter tips for your family's health. It's sort of the topic they're doing. Uh, in, in information you need to know, talk to Stephanie Smith about that. I think it's part of our homeschool ministry. And also, next Sunday is Children's Ministry Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a luncheon afterwards for all those that are serving in our children's ministry. Also, for anyone that may be interested in this hearing about our children's ministry, there's always a need in our children's ministry. And we're very, very excited about what God's doing in our children's ministry. That ministry is really growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, but we need to sort of be on the same page. So I encourage you to come out for that. It's be an encouraging time. It's going to be, again, a luncheon afterwards and just information about our children's ministry. So please make sure you're aware of that. And it'll be right after our service. Also on the 27th at 9 o'clock in the morning, that's a Saturday morning, there's a men's Bible study and breakfast. So gentlemen, please come out, bring your sons to that. Uh, we'd appreciate you doing that. We're going to have a time of worship and a Bible study, talk about some of the vision for our men's ministry this coming year. And so that'll be, again, at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning on the 27th. It lasts about an hour and a half or two hours at the most. So uh, we'll be out, you know, by probably about 1030 or so. But we're going to have breakfast, probably just something like uh, sandwiches, something like that, maybe Chick-fil-A, chicken and biscuit or whatever, or sausage and biscuit or whatever it is. And also there's a ladies' Bible study starting February 6th, and it's called When You Pray. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. Uh, it's going to be uh, studies on prayer. It's a seven-week study, ladies. Uh, it's going to meet on Tuesday mornings and Tuesday night. The Tuesday morning study does have child care. The Tuesday night study does not. So there's a sign-up sheet out there. There's a table out there set up for that ministry. We encourage you to maybe stop by and look at that, think about it. Bring somebody, reach out, ladies. We encourage you to come to part of that. It's just part of the ongoing study we do in the spring and the fall for our ladies. Um, so just come and be a part of that. It's a great time to, to be a part of it. So let's all stand and we'll pray. Ask God's blessing on this service. Father, we want to come to you in the name of Jesus this morning and just pray. Um, we we, we want to make sure that we're focused on you. I know there's a lot of activities, a lot of stuff going on. I know it's the you know, beginning of a whole new year, and uh, there are burdens, there are things we're struggling with, but we just pray this morning that we would really be turning our heart, our attention, our focus on you, to magnify you, even the needs that we have, the struggles we have, to bring them to you. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I pray that in our service. Uh, as we worship, as we hear the word of God this morning, that you would help us to bring those needs to you and look to you and expect from you. And I know this morning at the end of uh, our worship time, we're going to install new elders and deacons. And I just pray your blessing upon that time. Thank you for these men and those that have served and that are rotating off the boards. We just want to pray for them and pray for those new individuals that you're raising up. You just bless them and anoint them and bless our fellowship. We thank you for the, the ongoing opportunity in our fellowship, just to serve in these areas. Uh, we do pray for our children's ministry, and just think about next Sunday, and ask your blessing upon it. Thank you for all those men and women that dedicate time uh, in so many ways, the worship team, the children's ministry, the, the youth, all these activities that are so vital to us as a church, and we ask your blessing on every one of them. May you guide and direct us. May you give us wisdom. May we see your hand this year by bringing revival to this place. We need that personally, individually, and corporately. We pray for our nation. We continue to lift up Israel and the, the ongoing conflict. Please, Lord, may you intervene. May they understand Jesus and the Messiah and who has come. Uh, we pray for those individuals who have lost lives. We think of so many loved ones uh, who are gone, and yet it's devastating to those families on both sides of the conflict. Father, we just pray you would turn the attention of people to the fact that we're here and gone, and there's an eternity after this life, 
And I just pray those individuals would seek you and understand that you're there calling and moving. We pray your blessing on all those believers that are in on both areas, that they would be opening their mouths and sharing the gospel and preaching the word and pointing people to Christ. And we pray that would happen here in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
everything I need. Amen. Savior, I come. Quiet my soul, remember redemption's here where your blood was spilled. into this next song, you know, take this time to just reflect and, and worship the Lord in whatever posture you wish. So if you want to remain seating, that's great. If you want to stand, please be my guest.
experience. Lord, this morning we come to you because you are alone, unique. There's no one like you. When we get to know you, when we experience your great love and mercy, when we realize your love is truly unconditional, you love us because you've chosen to love us. There's nothing about ourselves that you love in and of itself. You just love. God is love. And so we come this morning knowing that in Christ we have all those precious needs of love, security, peace, joy, meaning, and purpose. All these things are fulfilled as we come to know you and walk with you because we were created by you, but we were also created for you. Lord, I know there's burdens on each one of our hearts. There are situations that are sometimes overwhelming to us and we just want to bring those people or those situations before you may we recognize the God that is in heaven who has looked down upon us who has loved us with an everlasting love who sent his son to down the cross is a God who loves us and cares about everything about us the Bible says your thoughts towards us are more numerous than the sand by the sea and so we come to you we bring these burdens these people these situations And we present them to you and we pray, Lord, give give grace, guide and direct, give answers, move by your spirit, do things that nobody else can do. And I pray that you would give us grace. Sometimes situations don't change, but your goal is to change us, just to rest in the knowledge that you understand. You see the end of a thing from the beginning. You know what you're doing. And I pray that we could come by faith and just Leave these things in your mighty hands. So may you be glorified. May you be blessed. May we be free from the burdens that we oftentimes carry because we think somehow we're supposed to solve these things and they're way beyond us. But we thank you that we can come to you. You've made a way for us to approach the very presence of God himself through the person of Jesus. And so we offer up these prayers, these requests, these situations, these people that are on our hearts. We give them to you in the precious name of Jesus. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth like it is in heaven in these situations, in these lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning we have uh, some elders and deacons to install this morning. So I'm going to ask, I think Dan Bailey is here, a a former elder who is rotating off the board. We have a rotating board. These guys serve for a couple of years. Greg Carlton is out of town this morning, so Dan's coming up. But I'd also ask Matthew Martin and Gary Galusi to come up. These two guys are going to be serving as elders. Also, uh, just to let you know, uh, Richard Smith and Sway Oliveris, they're both serving as deacons. The guys that have rotated off the board are Timothy uh, at the end and Matthew Martin. Uh, Matthew's up here is going to be serving as an elder now. So also Oscar Diaz and Mark Kipko, you guys here? If you guys would come on up too also. We'll lay hands on you guys too, and Dan will. Uh, Dan has enough anointing of the Spirit to cover all the bases, right, Daniel? (laughs) Let me just say, I'm very grateful, and and the reason we do a rotating board, we just believe that, you know, we want people to have an opportunity to serve in these areas, and it's very important. Um, Just to let you know, the elders primarily oversee the spiritual aspects of it. Uh, Just to let you know, if I ever, ever get off in left field, they have the authority and responsibility to get rid of me. And to find somebody that can do a good job. So <laughs> the deacons are primarily responsible for the uh, practical aspects of the ministry. Most of our uh, you know, the ushers, greeters, golf cart people, those guys are deacons that serve in that area overseeing that. There's also, of course, volunteers that help. But these guys are very uh, responsible for doing that. So we appreciate you guys serving. Uh, the guys that have served uh, before, too, also. Let's pray for these guys. Lord, we just thank you for these men and their families and... Uh, just the, the fact that, that, that these individual individuals have come because of recommendations. People have, have shared and talked about them and said these individuals, uh, we believe to be qualified to serve in these areas of elders and deacons. And so we just lay our hands upon them. We pray. We know that it's not our hands that mean anything. It's you that touches them by your hand. Our hands represent the hand of Christ. But we are here to acknowledge these men and pray. We thank you for the guys that have served. I want to thank you for Dan and Greg that have served as elders and as they rotate off and ask your blessing upon these men. Thank you again for the input and the direction and the help that they've 
provided. Thank you for the guys that have served as deacons. For, for Timothy, Lord, thank you again for these individuals who are rotating off Matthew in this area. We just pray for wisdom. And help us to remember to pray. The Bible says we're to pray for those that you've put over us in the Lord. Uh, and we just pray that we would be men and women that intercede and pray and ask your blessing. Recognize the best of men are men at best. And we're just individuals. We have qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. Uh, but that doesn't mean these guys are perfect. Nobody's perfect but you. But at the same time, these standards, these qualifications are important. And so we come to you this morning. We ask your blessing upon them, their families. We pray you continue to guide us and give us wisdom as a church. Lord, we just want to know and be in the center of what you're doing, what your will is, what you're saying to us. May you be glorified. May your will be accomplished. And, and I pray that if we ever get off, if we ever, you know, deal with us, work in us, uh, Lord, as David says in Psalm, Lord, search me and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me. Purify my heart, Lord. Purify our hearts so that we can be in the center of what you want, what your will is, what your plan is, that you may be glorified. All the attention would be focused on you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Praise the Lord. All right. All right, we're uh, still in our study of the book of Galatians. You may want to turn there. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to finish up this fifth chapter this morning. We are moving through Galatians. <laughs> it's, we've been in a while in Galatians, right? Where are we going next? Well, guess. <laughs> Ephesians. We finished 1 Samuel last Wednesday night. We're going to 2 Samuel this coming Wednesday. Let me invite you out. We have a supper together and fellowship together and... I break bread together. It's a great time. It's like a big party downstairs. And then we open the word up. We're going to start again in 2 Samuel. Saul has been killed uh, in 1 Samuel. He's dead now. David has been running from him. So we'll see God now installing David as king. Very interesting, these books. So we, uh, there's always practical application. And certainly we, we know that in the book of Galatians. The theme of our study of Galatians has primarily been the grace of God that we are under a new covenant, that new covenant is basically defined by God's grace, which simply means God provides for us all that we need to serve Him. Uh, the old covenant, the Old Testament, the old law was focused on what we do for Him. It gave commandments, certain laws and responsibilities and regulations and all these things, but they were sort of precursors, always pointing to ultimately the fact that under the old covenant, the old law, we could never do enough. Uh, we could never measure up. What God basically said, if I can sort of summarize the old covenant, was if you can keep all these things and do all these things perfectly, you can get to heaven. But we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. Nobody can keep all those laws. And so God uh, created, designed a new covenant uh, ratified, brought into power by the blood of Christ when he died on the cross. And that new covenant is really basically God now doing in us, to us, through us, what we can never do in and of ourselves. That's grace. Grace is God enabling us, God empowering us. And so we're going to talk about this morning, the title of this message is Living in the Grace of God. In other words, God empowers us to follow him, to serve him. This world's going to hell in a handbasket, you know, the old phrase. And so the, the bottom line is people do not have in and of themselves the power to do the right thing. They sometimes want to, but they don't. The Bible says, that, as Paul said in the seventh chapter of, of Romans, to will is present with me, but how to perform that which I would, I don't know. Well, the way to perform what we want to do deep inside our heart is by the grace of God. God enables us. Uh, God makes us not only both to will, but to do of his good pleasure, the Bible says. That is God giving us grace. How does God do that? There are certain what I would call means of grace. That was an old phrase used back in the 1700s. And the means of grace, in other words, how does God give me grace in order to follow him? Well, part of it is what we're doing this morning. We gather to hear the word. As we gather to hear the Word of God, as we are under the teaching of the Bible and the Holy Spirit's here and we worship Him, God, God empowers us, God, God challenges us, God gives us His heart and His mind. Reading through the Bible, a lot of people have committed to the reading of the Bible all the way through. And so there was an, a Bible we gave out in December. It was a year, year reading the Bible. 
It was sort of designed by that. So we're sort of bouncing around through the Bible. But in one year, if you keep up with all that, um, you'll go through the entire Bible in one year. That is a means of grace. How is that possible? Well, as you read the Word, God is giving us His heart, His vision, His worldview. It affects us. It changes us. God's Word is living and powerful, the Bible says. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So God's Word enables us. Pa- pa- David said in Psalms, like, where have I hid my heart? That I would, I would not sin against you. So God, God, as I read the Word and meditate on the Word, God empowers me and helps me not to sin. Because the Word begins to affect me. It begins to, I begin to think about sin and what the Bible teaches us. Uh, you know, all these kinds of things. Fasting is a means of grace. Fellowship is a means of grace. Meeting on a Sunday or a Wednesday, small groups, men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies are a means by which God gives us grace. Individuals who do not do these things, who do not read the Word, do not pray, do not fast, do not meet together as God's people are commanded to do, they are cutting themselves off from the means of grace. So these things are profitable to us, just like we're doing this morning. We're talking about living in the grace of God, living under that uh, power of God's divine grace. And that's what Paul sort of in, uh, in this fifth chapter talks about. So look, if you will, in verses 16 through 18, we'll talk about the flesh and the spirit. Chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But those who are led by the Spirit, when you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So look, first of all, in verse 16, the key to victory. What does he say here in verse 16? Here's what he says. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It means to walk in the center of God's will, to be in, in, in harmony with what God wants, what God desires, to see the world the way God sees it. If we're walking in the Spirit, we're walking in God's will. And if we're walking in the Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're not going to give in. When it says the flesh, it means the, the natural uh, sort of the rudimentary basic desires. In other words, God created us a certain way. And when sin entered creation, these natural desires got twisted, sort of got out of sync. And that's the problem. But if we walk in the Spirit, if we're under the control of the Holy Spirit, if we're allowing God's Spirit to, to fill us or the grace of God to empower us, then we're not going to fulfill the lust or the desires or the sinful desires. We all have sinful desires. You know, Paul said in the seventh chapter of Romans, the things that I hate, I keep doing. <laughs> There's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. That's what he's talking about in this study. So we're talking about living under the grace of God, allowing God to always give me this ability to walk in the spirit, walk in harmony with him. Or another way to say that as we think about the means of grace is the more I'm in the Word and the more the Word is in me, the more victory I'm going to have. The more I'm in, I'm in fellowship, the more I'm connected to God, the more I'm in prayer, the more, the more I'm in fellowship with God's people and hearing the Word of God and I have accountability. As iron sharpens iron, the Bible says, so a man sharpens his friend. God wants that accountability. Why? That accountability in my life enables me to continue to walk in the Spirit because it's so easy to get off, you know, in in, in the flesh. What what does that mean? It means that all of a sudden someone says something or does something you don't like and you, you want to respond in a negative way. You want to curse at them or yell at them or whatever it may be. That's the flesh. That's just the flesh reacting. The Holy Spirit wants to give me the power of God you know, it's, it's, it's not that we're just free from sin. We're free from the power of sin. God gives us a choice. But now, since I'm a believer, I've got the power, the ability to choose to allow the Holy Spirit to enable me to do the right thing, if that makes sense. Because all of us are in situations that are very difficult. Sometimes people say things and do things in our lives that provoke us. Sometimes situations are there, and they're not easy situations. They're difficult. Sometimes we can have physical challenges that just irritate us, or maybe we're irritable because of physical challenges. You know, but walking in the Spirit means always having the demeanor of Christ, the attitude of Christ. That's what he means by that. 
So it's the key to victory in verse 16. Look at verse 17. It's every Christian's, every believer's battle, verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. What does that mean? It means that I've got a physical body. Paul goes into this in the seventh chapter of Romans. He says this. He says, basically, when God came to save me, I've got a, a, a living spirit inside of me. I'm born again. I'm born of the spirit. I've got a body, soul, and spirit. But my physical body still has these sinful desires. That's the flesh. That's what is defined by the flesh. So Paul says, even though I'm born again, even though I'm saved, even though I have this amazing relationship with Christ, the flesh is still warring and battling these things. In other words, okay, you know, we have this commitment to read through the Bible in one year. You know, we know that's good. We know that's profitable. We know that's one of the means of grace. The flesh says, ah, don't worry about it. You can catch up tomorrow. Or the flesh says, instead of getting up in the morning, maybe a little bit before work or before the activities and spending time in prayer and the Word, just sleep in. <laughs> That's the flesh. Or, you know, going to church today, it's really cold out there. You know, and the flesh says, don't do that. So that, that's that, all of us struggle with that. All of us have that battle inside. It's part of being a believer. It's part, as Paul said, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Why? I do not let this physical body and sin that's still working in my body control me. I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, not by the flesh. And there's this battle between flesh and spirit. That's what he says in verse 17. The flesh lusts or fights against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. He says, these are contrary to the one to the other so that you do not do the things that you wish. Man, if we just had that absolute self-control, what would happen if we just did everything we knew that we should do all the time? <laughs> that's, that's the battle we face. That's the struggle we face. And the Bible brings that out. I wish when God designed salvation, that God had designed it so that when I came to Christ, he would change this physical flesh and it would be sort of different. Or he would give me my new body that I'm going to get in heaven. But that's not what he did. He wants me to learn to, uh, the self-control. He wants me to learn discipline and patience. He wants me to keep under my body. It's a, it's a part of this whole idea, walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. That's what the Bible says. If I'm, I'm in the Spirit, I'm not going to be in the flesh. So it's a choice that I make. He brings that out in the next point. Look, if you will, in verse, verse 18. In verse 18, he says that. But if you are led by the Spirit, meaning you're allowing the Spirit to influence you and empower you, and you're yielding to the Spirit. If you're led by the Spirit, you will not fulfill. What does he say in verse 18? You're not under the law. What does that mean? It means this. The law is focused as to what I do for God. The law tells me rules and regulations. Don't do this, do this, all these rules and regulations. Basically, what the Bible teaches me is I just yield to the Lord. I walk in this harmony and relationship with Him, and, and I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under the grace of God. God empowers me by the relationship, not by rules. There are, there are people who think they, they do have all these rules, and as long as you keep all the rules, you're okay. But don't break the rules. Well, the, the New Testament is all about relationship. I have this relationship with Christ. And it's that nearness to Christ. It's that relationship, that the harmony with Him that gives me power over the flesh. Paul says in the sixth chapter of Romans that if I yield my members to sin, I become a slave to it. We see that so often when it comes to pornography. An individual yields to pornography, begins to see and look at pornography, and all of a sudden it gets a hold of it, they become a slave to it. They're, they're empowered by it. So if I yield to the flesh, if I give in to the flesh, or if I have a problem with temple, a temper and I fly off the handle real easy, somebody does something I don't like, and all of a sudden I, I lose it, I'm yielding to the flesh. And when you do that, it's easier the next time. That's what I mean by this battle between, sure, I mean, it'd be nice to punch somebody out when you're mad, you know, but that's not what Jesus taught us. <laughs> he taught us to love our enemies and pray for those that abuse us, and that's what it means to walk in the Spirit. But if I'm walking in the Spirit, I'm not under the law. I'm not concerned about rules. 
Another way to say that is this. I'm not focused on rules and, 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 and laws. What I'm focused on is this relationship with Christ. Why? Because when I'm in harmony with Christ, I'm walking in the Spirit. Another way to say that is when I give in to the flesh, I'm hurting my relationship with Christ. So the believer's focus is not on the rules, it's on the relationship. And there's power and energy and life that flows into my life by this relationship. God gives me grace. Another way to say that is the closer I am to Jesus, the more unified I am with Christ, the more power I have over my physical body and my flesh. I'm relying upon God's divine grace, not some rules and regulations. That's what it means. So he talks about this. The 8th chapter of Romans, let me just say chapter 6 of Romans, and I won't talk about those chapters too much. But in the 6th chapter, Paul basically says that we, we, we died to the old man. I'm, I'm buried with Christ by baptism to death. I, the old man died. He's going to talk about that in a minute. And then, and, and then he talks about don't yield. If, if I, sin shall no longer have dominion over me. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. And that's what it says in the 6th chapter of Romans. But then he gets to the 7th chapter and says, and yet if I'm under God's grace, why do I find this war going on between my flesh and and what I know deep inside, that's right. This flesh between, uh, the battle between flesh and spirit. There's this constant war between my flesh and the spirit. But he moves on into chapter 8. And the key to the victory is not yielding to the flesh, but yielding to the spirit. In other words, remember how the Bible says God shall never allow you to be tempted? More than you're able to withstand, but he will with the temptation always provide a way to escape that you can bear it. What does that mean? It means when, when I'm tempted to get in the flesh, when somebody says something or does something that's going to provoke me, and I have a tendency to want to, you know, unload on them. God always is there telling me, Mark, don't do that. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit give you grace to love that person, pray for that person, walk away from that person. depends on the situation. But to do what you need to do. God gives me grace. I've got to make that choice. I've got to make that decision. I've got to stay free from that, the law. I've got to focus on the relationship. Because in order for me to get into the flesh, I'm walking away from the closeness and nearness of the Lord. That's what the Bible talks about. So in this, these first three verses, he brings it up. Now look in verses 19 through 23. Works or fruit. Oops, excuse me. There, there's the third part of my first point. I'm moving to my second point, which is works or fruit. Think about the difference. Meditate on the difference. Look what he says again in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Uh, the word for sorcery is the word pharmakia. Incidentally, where we get our word pharmacy or drugs, they're always connected. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. And, and, and anything else that I hadn't mentioned right now. <laughs> of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you that in times past, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Well, he, he, if, you're, if you're crucified with Christ, that old nature is dead. You can't live in a state of sin and be a believer. Why? Jesus came and delivered me from the power of sin. So if I'm in the flesh, that this is the flesh. This is the work of the flesh. The word work is where we get our word energia from. It's the activity or the effort or the work produced by the flesh. This energy in me, this, this ungodly temptation to do the wrong thing, to make the wrong choice. To, to just, you know, you know, the old statement, if it feels good, do it. Well, don't do that because you'll ruin every relationship you got. Because you know? somebody's going to say something you don't like, and you're going to want to say something or do something you shouldn't do, and it'll just destroy that. So God wants us not to give in to the flesh. The work of the flesh is anything contrary to God's heart. I mean, just look at the list. And it's not just the actions, it's the thoughts. You know, the, the, the whole idea of thoughts or wrong words or whatever it may be. And we always make excuses. The, the Bible says every way of man's right in his own eyes. 
but the Lord ponders the heart. It's easy to justify wrong actions. So we need to be honest about ourselves and realize there are works of the flesh. There are, there, the flesh is there, and I've got to, you know, at the end of chapter 7, let me just share this real quick if you haven't heard this before. But in the 7th chapter, Rome, Paul mentions a statement. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And Paul was referring in that phrase to a means by which the Romans punished murderers. And one of the means that the Romans had when someone murdered somebody else is they would strap the dead body of the murdered victim to the living person. And that body would begin to rot and it would actually eat into that living body. It would eventually kill them. Can you imagine how horrible that was? When Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's what he's referring to. He says, I'm dragging this carcass around with me, this physical body that I'm stuck with, that I'll have until I die or the Lord comes back and changes me into, a, into a, gives me my new body. But I'm stuck with it. And I can't ignore that. I've got to deal with it. I've got to recognize it. I've got to understand the definition of the works of the flesh. And that's why he makes this list. He basically says anything that's contrary to God's heart is a work of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit. There's a war between the flesh against the spirit. Or another way to say that is everything God wants, the flesh doesn't. I mean, it's very simple. And he makes mention that that's the work of the flesh. But also he talks about the second thing is fruit of the spirit. Now, again, let me just stop for a moment. What's the difference between works and fruit? Fruit is the product of resting. Fruit is the product of abiding. The Bible says, you are the, you know, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, what does it mean? Just rest in the relationship. Just abide in Christ. The fruit is the natural result of that. I'm not focused for instance, uh, as he talks about, look what he says again in verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Some, some believe that love is the first word, the main word, and from love comes joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. In other words, the fruit or the result of me abiding in Christ is, this, is, is the fruit of the Spirit. What am I saying? I'm not focused on loving people. <laughs> I'm just focused on Jesus. And if I'm abiding in Christ and I love Christ and I'm pursuing Christ, the fruit, the natural result of that is love. I will be growing in my love, in my patience, in my long-suffering, in my gentleness, in my kindness, in my self-control. It's result. It's the fruit of abiding. Does that make sense? Think about what I'm saying. The fruit is result of just being attached. And it's the grace of God. When he talks about living in the grace of God, it means just stay attached to Christ. Just stay close to Jesus. Focus on the relationship with him, knowing him, studying him. That's why I read the Bible. We read the Bible to understand him and know him and pursue him and love him. We came to sing till we're worshiping him and thanking God for all the things he's done. We pray. We're bringing our burdens to him and talking to him about these things. We're meditating on who he is, what he's done, what he can do, his promises. All that is about building a relationship with Christ. That's so vital. As I, as I abide in that relationship, as I draw nearer to him and I pursue him and I rest in him, he's going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of abiding in him is just the natural byproduct. You know, in the springtime, you've already got buds on your fruit trees. I know I've got apple trees and fruit, you know, uh, you know, pear tree, and I've got you know, fig trees, and I've got blueberries. And they are, they are got buds already on there. They're not going, oh, I'm trying so hard to get out, you know. It's just sitting there. And it's just allowing this sap as the spring comes and the soil warms and the light comes out. All of a sudden we see these, these, these flowers come out. And it's just abiding. And all of a sudden these flowers just develop. Think about it. They just develop. They just begin to change. They just begin to morph. We are being morphed. We are being changed. The Bible says from glory to glory to be like Christ. How do I do that? 
How is the means by which God does that? By me just focusing on Christ. I'm not trying to morph. I'm just trying to know him and love him. Just to understand his heart. But it's the natural fruit or byproduct of just being close to Christ. So my point in that is do everything that you can to be close to Jesus. Pursue him. There's lots of hobbies, lots of activities, a lot, lot of things you can do. But I'm telling you, the more that you put Christ as the center of your life, the center of your family, the center of your heart, the center of what you do, the center of your job, the center of everything, the more you're going to be transformed from glory to glory to become more and more like Christ. It's the natural byproduct, the fruit of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Because the moment we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. As he abides in us and we abide in him, he begins to transform us. He prunes us. Sometimes there's old branches that do not produce good fruit. And, and you got to cut them away. I've got my blueberries. I've got, you know, if they're about seven years old or more, I've got to cut the, I've had them about 20-something years. you got to cut them out because if you don't cut them out, it's going to affect the rest of it. The same way God begins to prune us, he begins to work in our lives. It's the relationship. It's the dynamic. But, but, but the apple tree or the blueberry, it's not focused on trying to produce fruit. It's just abiding. You see what I'm saying? There are people who are focused on rules. It's all about rules and doing this and don't doing that. But the focus of the scripture is just the relationship with Christ. Yes, I get up every morning and I've done it for I don't know how many years and I read my Bible and pray, but I do it to know Jesus. I do it because I love the Lord and I believe it's part of his will for my life. And it's sort of a habit with me. I've got a habit. I, I was telling someone earlier before the service started, I, I'm glad when the holidays are over because <laughs> I, like, I like routine. I'm just a, when, I, when I'm in routine, I'm doing well. When routine gets, I get knocked off base. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, you know, just that's me. I, I tend to, to flourish in routine. But it can easily become law. It can easily become so rigid that there's no flexibility. That's bad. You just need to go with the flow and trust the Lord, and, and, but build a relationship with Christ, and he'll produce the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is thereby abiding. Then law, also verses 24 through 26, he talks about being crucified and resurrected. Look in verse 24, it says this, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does that mean? It means the moment you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you are unified, you are bonded with Christ. In other words, what Jesus does, the way that God saves people, is when you repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ, you are one with Christ. You are joined to Christ. Now that joining goes back to the cross. We are buried with him. That's what he says here in verse 24. Those who are Christ have crucified, past tense, the flesh, with its passions and desires. In other words, the moment I came to Christ, that life that had been dominated by the flesh, controlled by the flesh, all I thought about was if it feels good, do it. And all of a sudden now I came to Christ, I'm born again. But when I'm born again, I'm identified with Christ's death. Let me just read you some verses that are, are, are about this. Galatians 6.14, we'll get that later on, but here's what it says. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. What does that mean? It means that when I came to Jesus, no longer did I look to the world to provide meaning and purpose. I looked to the Lord to provide all that. The moment I came to Christ, I'm a part of his kingdom. I'm no longer a part of the world's kingdom. There are two kingdoms. There are those who are believers and those who are not. The Bible says we're in the world, but not of it. We've been born into the family of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says this, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sins might be destroyed. I'm crucified with the Christ, Paul said. Galatians 2.20, we've already looked at this. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. When I came to believe in Jesus, I'm, I'm unified. I'm one with him. 
We've talked over and over again about our position. Where is the believer's position? We are in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The moment we're saved, we're moved from being in the world to being in Christ. The world is dead to us. I'm crucified with Christ. Paul said, I'm dead. And my life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is my life, shall appear, then I'll also appear with him in glory. But I'm dead. I'm dead. Reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus. What does it mean, reckon? The word reckon is an accounting term. It means it's fact. The moment you accept Christ, the power of the flesh was crucified with Christ. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Why? You are crucified with Christ. And it's a concept in the Bible over and over again, but Paul's bringing that out. He basically said in the 8th chapter of Romans, everyone who's born again is in the Spirit. Everyone who's born again is in the Spirit by definition. Why? The moment you accept Christ, you're born into the spiritual realm. You're part of His kingdom. Sin shall not have dominion over you. It cannot. That's one of the signs of a true believer. Because we have authority. Do we sin sometimes? Of course we do. <laughs> Somebody says something and we... If we blow up and like, oh, I blew it. I got in the flesh. Yet we, we repent of that. We get back in the right attitude. We're, we're crucified. The believer has died with Christ. A very important concept. So look in verse 24. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let me ask you a question. Have you been crucified with Christ? Have you put your faith and trust and hope in Jesus and Jesus alone? There's no other way. There's no other means by which you can get to heaven except to be identified. Not only are we identifying with his death, we we identify with his burial. Paul Paul said the sixth chapter, chapter of Romans, buried with him by baptism unto death. But we'll also talk about in the book of, of Ephesians, next book over to this, we're also risen with him. Not only are we crucified and buried, but we're also risen. And we're in Christ. We're seated with him in heavenly places. The second chapter of Ephesians puts that out plain and clear. That's why we're alive. We're alive because he's alive. And Paul makes a statement. How do I walk in the spirit? Just yield to the spirit. And then look finally in verses uh, 25 and 26. Notice how he makes this statement, let us. Verse 25, if we live in the spirit, in other words, if you're truly saved, let us also walk in the spirit. If you're a belie- in other words, are you a Christian? Act like it. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Are you a follower of Christ? Act like it. There's no reason for you not to act like it. If you're a true believer, God gives you as much grace as you need. God gives you grace to forgive. He gives you grace to, to turn the other cheek. He gives you grace. It's hard. Yes, it's hard. Sure is hard, but the more we yield to the Spirit, the easier it becomes. The more we yield to Christ, the simpler it gets. And all of a sudden, God begins to change us. Why? We yield to the, we don't give in to the flesh. The works of the, of the flesh are bad. <laughs> you're, you're in a marriage and there's a fleshly, carnal husband or wife. It's bad. It brings destruction, self-centeredness, all about me. But the fruit of a man or a woman that's, that's Christ, that belongs to the Lord, that's born again, the fruit of that person, the, the aim of that person is Christ and being like Jesus. And we are being transformed. We are growing in grace and in knowledge, in maturity. When we first come to the kingdom, there's a lot of immaturity. There's a lot of carnality and worldliness in our lives. Why? Where we're used to, if something happens, I'm used to just spouting off. I remember... Before I got saved, you know, anytime I would pass a police car, I would just freeze up. You know, it's like, oh, what if, is there anything in the car, you know? <laughs> and I'll never forget, I got, I got t- totally transformed by God's grace at college. And I was driving, and I re- went through a red light. This is maybe a month after I, I got saved. I went through a red light, and it was pouring down rain, and, and uh, my, my first response when I stopped my car was to get out, walk over the police, and I know you're not supposed to do that, but I thought I felt so bad because I did not want that policeman to get out in the rain because I ran a red light. 
And he was like, what are you doing? I said, well, I am so sorry. He gave me a warning. Yes, praise God. <laughs> but what I wanted to say to was, was this. I'm thinking, wow, what a difference <laughs> between when it, before I got saved and now that I'm a believer. My first part when I was not saved was panic, you know, like, if I got drugs in the car, if there's alcohol in the car, you know. And now it's like I just feel sorry for that guy getting out in the rain. It's like, wow, Lord, you have, I'm, I'm a different person. I'm a different person because Jesus has transformed my life. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. How does that happen? By the grace of God. God comes and does that to us. I don't do that of myself. I don't try to do that. It's the natural result of the Lord working in us. Working through us. He works in us. So my point, again, in closing is this. Do you know Jesus? You know, we're starting out in, in 2024. You're going to have a lot of trials and tribulations and difficulties. There's a lot of things happening in this world. It's just part of life. Jesus said in the world you have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. We need the grace of God. We need God's grace to enable us to follow Jesus in a very ungodly world. That's getting worse. And so God gives us everything we need. He gives us grace. There is a throne called the throne of grace. We are to come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? So that I can find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And when I'm struggling and I don't understand things, I go to the Lord and talk to him, and he just tells me, Mark, you know, you know how many times the Lord, he doesn't explain. He, he, a lot of times God doesn't explain things to me. I want an explanation. I want to understand why. He's like, you know, it's none of your business why. But what he does is tell me, just trust me. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? And all of a sudden you realize you're just trusting. You know why you're trusting? Because you know him. The more you know him, the deeper your knowledge of him, the more you trust him. You realize he knows what he's doing. He's faithful. He's just. He's got a plan. He's got a thing he's doing. All things are working together for good. If you love God or in, in his will, you just begin to trust him. Why? You know him. The more you know him, the more you trust him. The less you know him, it's hard to trust the Lord. It's hard just to walk by faith. We want him to explain things to us. You know, he, he doesn't ask me. He doesn't come to you and say, please, you know, let me explain all this to you. He just does what he does. And he wants us to trust him. I pray this morning that you would, you would live in the grace of God. That grace would be a major factor in your life so that when you're following Christ and Jesus is just illuminating everything around you, you can tell other people, look, it's not me, it's Christ. It's God's grace. God is enabling me. It's God doing this. It's not me. I have no special powers. I have no special relationship that other, other believers don't have. All I'm trying to do is follow Christ. You know, I'm just trying to follow Jesus, do the best I can. And I've, I fall down all the time. But God gives me grace just to get up and dust myself off and just keep plugging away because he's faithful. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we close our study here, thank you again for your grace. We don't want to be individuals who talk about grace. We want to be individuals who have experienced the grace of God, the enabling power of the Holy Spirit that enables us and empowers us and, and, and fills us with the ability to do the right thing. And so at the end of our study, when, when Paul says, let us, let us, he's saying, make a choice. Make a choice. Make a decision as a believer. You have that freedom. God's not going to make me follow him. He's going to let me. Let me follow him. Let me yield to him. Let me give in to his grace. Or I can give in to my flesh. I can give in to my old ways and yield to that. But if I yield to the flesh, I become a slave to it. And I don't want to be a slave to it. I pray for any persons here this morning who may be in bondage. I think about what I said earlier about pornography. So many have destroyed or are destroying their lives through yielding their eyes Job said in the book of Job, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon another woman? And I just pray that this morning as we come here that you would enable us by your divine grace to yield to the Spirit, not to the flesh. 
And I know that those first steps away from those kinds of things are very difficult because we're so trained to give in to our flesh, we're a slave to it. And so now that we're saved, we have this choice, this amazing choice, not to yield to the flesh or give in to the flesh, but rather yield to the Holy Spirit. He's there. The Holy Spirit is there in the heart of every Christian to provide His strength, His power, His supernatural ability to say no to the flesh and say yes to God. And so I want to pray this morning as we begin this year that maybe there's a lot of carnality or worldliness or maybe our commitment to Christ has been very shallow. There may be individuals here this morning who you're saying, look, you need to get serious about God. The world's changing very rapidly. And now it's time to put your heart, your focus, your family on Christ and his kingdom and his word. And I just pray for anybody here in this sanctuary, maybe those that are tuning in live to the service, I just pray they can make that commitment, Lord, but also realize I can make every commitment in the world, but I'm dependent upon the grace of God to keep that commitment. May we never in our own strength try to fight this battle. You are our strength, Lord. You are our, our, our fortress. You are our shield. We yield to the Holy Spirit. We yield and let you come and fight our battles for us and enable us and empower us to walk in the Spirit. And when we walk in the Spirit and we do the right things and we get free from all this, these bondages and these chains of sin and flesh, may we always remember it was because of what you did for us. Therefore, you and you alone, Deserve all the credit, all the praise. And I just want to pray this morning for anybody that feels weak, feels helpless, that they will be open to coming at the end of the service as we have this prayer team to have, have them prayed for, to say, look, I'm struggling with an area of my life. I'm struggling with this area of my life. Or I'm, as a man, I'm struggling to lead my family spiritually. I'm struggling to, as a wife to, to honor my husband. I want to pray this morning, Lord, that we would realize that we need each other to pray for each other. One of the means of grace, one of the ways that you give us grace is by confessing our faults to one another and praying for one another that we might be healed. The Bible says we're to bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's one of the means of grace that we confess. We talk to other believers that are mature enough to keep things to themselves and we ask for prayer. We say, please pray for me. And it's in that humbling of ourselves and acknowledging our sin that we oftentimes find the victory because it's one of the means that you infuse us with grace. So I just pray this morning you would bless everyone here. You would help this year to be an amazing year that you would be glorified. We do ask for revival. We do pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this church, upon our lives, upon our homes. Because, Lord, we desperately need that, and we give you praise for it in Christ's name. Amen. In closing, let me just remind you, the ministry team is up here after the service. They'd love to pray with you. Uh, The the Bible says in the fifth chapter of James, if is any sick, let them call for the elders of the church. There's times that people expect the elders to hunt them down, but you are responsible to call (laughs) the elders of the church and to ask for prayer. That's so important. That's part of the humility of saying, I have a need in my life, and I need to come up and and let that need be known. They're up here to pray for you, not just the elders. We have a prayer team, so we encourage you to avail yourselves of that. So let's all stand, and we'll close with a song. As we close with this last song, I just think it's such a great reminder of God's grace for us that Christ truly is enough, right? No pressure on us. I couldn't take that kind of pressure if it was on me. So just reflect on that as we close out with this song.
great week. Stay warm out there.